Greetings folks and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your roundup of all things Maker and Embedded and Lovely. Uh, usually I film this show in a studio. Uh, I am not in that studio currently as you can tell. We are on the road at the minute and I am filming this from a very blustery field where there is a mixture of sun and incredibly heavy rain seemingly at random. So you're probably going to see both during this show. But if you are new here, the Electromaker Show covers all things to do with microcontrollers, single board computers, the amazing projects people make with them, some of the new products that may be coming out and things you can support on funding websites like Kickstarter or Crowdsupply. And today is no different. We'll also be taking a dip into YouTube to look at a fantastic conversion of a Massey uh, 65C tractor, I believe it is, Massey Ferguson, um, that someone has converted to an amazing electric tractor that can do everything that any electronic vehicle that you would want on a farm can do. It can lift, it can pull. It is amazing. And that's on the Leontronics YouTube channel. We'll be discussing that. Along with an amazing Edge uh, AI camera made of very cheap parts on the project page. And uh, yeah, there's lots to get through on this week's show. Um, and so it's me and the cricket next to me. Uh, yeah, let's get going. <laughs> It's an interesting thing to wonder uh, how I'm going to manage the sound edit of this when I have uh, a variety of different cicadas around me and uh, I can hear my children off in the distance doing something incredibly loud and potentially violent. <laughs> So we're going to move on to one of my favorite things I've seen in a while. Uh, Liam Tronix is a YouTuber who I was not familiar with until recently, um, but he seems to be a, a bit of a uh, can-do-everything person. He's uh, 3D printed vehicles, uh, mini little vehicles. He's uh, hacked very cheap robot hoovers, um, and there's a variety of different stuff already on his channel. But his latest three videos have really blown up, and that's because he took a Massey Ferguson uh, 65C tractor. I keep saying that as if I, I think that's the right one, because I think it's the same one as someone I know has. He Here's the thing, I've driven one of those tractors with a petrol engine in it. He has taken the petrol engine out of an old Massey Ferguson and put an electric motor in it just to see if it would work. And it does. And it's amazing. So I think it's a 65C. If you're a tractor person, uh, please don't get at me if I get it wrong. I'm not a tractor person. I'm just lucky enough to have driven a few. Um, I have relatives in Bavaria. Go figure. Um, but yes, uh, he take a, he's taken the C65, uh, the 65C and he's now calling it the E65 because it's the electric version. And it is a full EV conversion of a Massey Ferguson tractor. Um, it's powerful enough for various farm work. And as you'll see in the video, um, he does a tug of war against the car and very easily wins against it. Um, and he's really gone into to a lot of detail in order to get this working. He hasn't just slapped a motor on it to get it working. Although the beginning of the video is him pretty much slapping a motor on it and it just working. But anyway, um, he even added a clutch to it. Um, the original build of it just allowed it to go fast and he tested the speed of it and it uh, outpaced the original um, uh, petrol motor. Um, but he wanted it to be useful and for a, a tractor to be useful, you need a clutch. You need to be able to have uh, some really fine grain control over what the tractor is doing. So you can't really put a clutch onto an electric motor unless you build a hardware uh, clutch but why would you do that? You can just control that all in software, which is what he does. So he um, gets a foot pedal that kicks out a voltage and uses the ADC on an AT Tiny 85 on a custom PCB with a DAC to spit out the correct voltage to the motor, essentially giving him the same kind of feeling as a throttle and a clutch. Another nice touch is that the three-point hitch on Massey Ferguson tractors is attached directly to the engine. I don't know enough about it to know whether um, it's just a purely mechanical thing or whether it's built-in hydraulics. I think it's actually a built-in hydraulic system that the engine controls. So once you swap out the engine for a motor, you still have the three-point hitch. And a three-point hitch is essentially like the hitch on a car that you could move up or down, and there's three, three of them, three points. So, as you can see, this immediately means you can start using your electric tractor as a sort of quasi-forklift if you want, or attach a variety of different farming implements and tools to it. In fact, one of my favorite parts of this video is attaching a tiller to the back of it to till soil. And because it's an electric vehicle, you can use that electric vehicle indoors, and it's also almost silent. So there are three videos in the series, one where he talks about the conversion, one where he talks about adding the clutch, and one where he shows off the farm work. And I've probably used footage from all three of them freely as part of this section. Um, but I will leave a link to the more recent video underneath here, um, and then you can find the rest of them on his channel through that. Um, and his channel does seem like one of those ones where um, it's quite an interesting one. There's a handful of videos on there already of a massive array of different subjects. Um, so yeah, um, Liam's definitely one of the people who I had not heard of at all before last week, and will be watching closely from now on because yeah, 
yeah, again, fantastic video style, very funny. And despite the only 30 minutes runtime that this tractor has currently with the batteries it has, it already has utility. It is an indoor use tractor and adding a few extra battery packs will potentially double its runtime. Yeah, this is just a really fun project. And uh, I, at first thought, I don't know how I'd feel about someone taking apart a beautiful vintage tractor to put uh, electronics in it. And now I'm so very glad he did. The Embedded World Conference is coming up soon. It's on the 11th to the 13th of March this year in Nuremberg in Germany, although they do also have conferences in America and China as well. And we've been doing a bit of a series of videos about the conference, and today I'm going to talk about the startup area. Now, there's two sides to this. There's the side that um, the Embedded World folks want you to know if you're part of a startup, you to know if you're an investor, or you to know if you're working with a company who wants to get closer to startups, and the other side of it, which is my experience of actually being there and visiting the startup area. So. Startup City is a place where startups can show what they're working on, meet with decision makers from the manufacturing industry, as well as potential investors and financial experts. It is perfect for founders and startup companies alike looking to make connections. And that is the idea. It's not just sort of an area where people um, stand and give pitches, although that is definitely an element of it. There's an open area where people can pitch ideas to you, but there's also a bunch of mini stands. Um, if you've ever, ever been to an embedded conference before, you'll be used to some of the bigger names having a massive stand with all of their different things and lots of different examples. If you imagine one of those massive stands but broken down into smaller stands where each one is a different startup showing what they have, maybe it's their hardware, maybe it's a software solution they want to share with you, you can talk with them while they give a demonstration on the floor of the conference, which is how we have got a bunch of really interesting interviews which I'll go into in just a moment. So Startup City runs for the entirety of the event, but during that there's also a mixture of inspiring talks and workshops and chances for uh, to catch live pitches. There's also the D2XL Startup event happening throughout the entirety of the second day. So if there is something that you think you might be interested in being involved in, uh, you should check the uh, links underneath this video, because not only is there a link directly to the Startup City part of the Embedded World website, but there is a link to the contact for Startup City if you're interested in finding out more, being there, or finding out who is there if you want to come and visit them on the conference floor. From a personal perspective, the startup area has always been something that I found quite interesting because it's been really nice to speak to people who are in the process of making their idea a reality. And that can be at various different stages. It can be something where um, they're kind of starting off and looking for more capital and really trying to get the business off the ground, or at a point where the business is doing quite well, but they're trying to expand and maybe meet new people, uh, find new clients, or maybe even change the way that the business is working. Uh, three things that really jump to mind, and all of these are things that I will link below so you can see the full interviews. Uh, Tactoon were a company that we found quite interesting, um, partially because, uh, like many companies there, they had a, a very simple display showing what they uh, that what they had. Um, their tool is essentially a box, which is a no-code automation tool with a variety of different ways of sensing and sending out signals. And I think what they had it doing was uh, speaking to a stepper motor on a clamp, which was pulling and stretching jelly babies uh, out of proportion, which was a wonderful visual way of showing what their control box could do. Um, another uh, company that you may be familiar with is Pineberry Pi. Now, they uh, make hats for the Raspberry Pi 5, and in fact, they were making a variety of hats for the Raspberry Pi 5 before Raspberry Pi 5 even were. I think they were the first company to come out with a, a hat at the time uh, when the Pi 5 was announced. Um, and they've made a variety of amazing tools, and we got to chat with the two people who are the company while we were there. Something of personal interest to me was uh, Duduk, who are a company who work with a sound visualization tool. It's essentially software that will take any music in and create a variety of different kinds of visualizations for it. Um, and they really know what they're doing because this custom software is something that they put together as part of their live work as architectural projectionists and light specialists um, who work on a variety of events and have even done large scale uh, projections on big buildings like the Burj Khalifa, for example. Um, and so it was really interesting because that's something that was in my past. I've done architectural projection as part of a team before, so know a little bit of the tech behind it. And it was really interesting to see a company that had come from uh, using this as a performance tool and creating their own software that is, uh, became robust enough for them to then share it with the public and say, hey, if you want to create a music video out of your music that is completely generated from that music and reactive to it, then you can upload it to us and we can basically give you a video based on the software tools that we've already created. Uh, that was a really interesting interview as well. If you'd like to find out any more about those three things, do have a look in the comment section below. 
We are going to move on to a project on the Electromaker Project Hub by Mukesh Sankler, who has taken an ESP32 based development board with a camera, in this case the Fire Beetle 2, and turned it into an Edge AI ready camera specifically for training models and testing them. How has he done this? Well, essentially by using the development board, printing a, uh, a specific enclosure for it, and making custom software on the computer side in order to use it. So, um, the board, as I've mentioned, is a Fire Beetle. You could probably use any ESP32 board uh, with a camera for it. In in fact, there are specifically those ESP32 cam boards you can get for a few dollars off AliExpress that would be equally suited to this task, because everything that's really happening here is happening on the computer side. But before we talk about that, the hardware side of this is really quite interesting, because whether you're using a Fire Beetle or whether you're using an ESP32 development board, by taking that board and putting it into an enclosure and basically having it just, uh, having only having to do that, it doesn't have to have a battery in it or anything, because it's always going to work attached to your host computer. It takes it from something that is just a prototype in this case into something that could have real production use. Imagine you wanted to have a camera in place in a, a, an environment that was maybe not particularly nice. Um, you could use a cheap development board and cheap camera so your parts list is not very high. And if you swapped out the 3D printed case for say something with a little bit of IP uh, protection, like IP68 protection, so it can't, water can't get into it, dust can't get into it, then you have a camera that you can just sit somewhere and collect model data all day and all night as long as it is wired into a computer that could be indoors. Anyway, that's immediately what I thought, but that might be because I've been spending a lot of time outside in the rain recently. <laughs> So the software side of this is a Flask app written in Python um, that talks directly to the ESP32 camera um, and has a web interface on the computer that allows you to trigger when the images are taken and what is done with them. Um, and if you put your Edge Impulse credentials into the code before running it, then you can send those directly to Edge Impulse. And if you've ever used Edge Impulse before, you'll know that once you've got your data in there, it's relatively easy to use it. Edge Impulse has wonderful documentation. The thing about this project that I really like is that obviously if you're someone who is uh, really doing a lot of model and visual training, the idea of just having a dedicated camera that is designed to do it is a really useful thing. Um, instead of having to take a million pictures and then take an SD card out and then put it on the computer, you can just do it this way. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, there are so many relatively inexpensive ESP32 development boards with camera attachments that if you did create a somewhat rugged, rugged, ruggedized case, that's a difficult word to say, um, you could set it up almost anywhere and gather model data in a variety of different environments in order to train models that maybe no one's ever thought of training before. Although certainly, as I've said, being out in the beautiful flora and fauna of New Zealand with its incredibly changeable weather is definitely pushing me in the direction of making a slightly better, a more ruggedized and sealed case. <laughs> but it is a wonderful project, both in scope and execution. And if you would like to find out more about it, you can get the full design files and the code uh, in the description of this video. We're going to move on to a project called the Jackal Rebuilt Rebuilt, um, which is a fantastic thing that Tom Granger put up on Blue Sky that I, I just couldn't pass. Because this is one thing that I've uh, ranted on more about on this show than making music with microcontrollers. It's my love of uh, upcycling old technology, taking technology in its old beautiful box and turning it into something very new and very digital. By no means do I think you should destroy working analog beautiful old gear. There's a real place for that in my heart as well. But when you find a completely trashed old radio, there's something wonderful about putting some digital things inside it and turning it into a very new radio in an old box. This is taking that idea to a beautiful extreme. So the Jackal is the name for a Sony FX300, a portable cassette player and recorder, a FM radio and black and white television that has batteries in it, was ruggedized and was released in 1978, which is an incredible thing in and of itself. This must have been a technological marvel at its time, but it looks absolutely wonderful. And this is something that, uh, yeah, Tom noticed and said, I want, and so he did get two of them uh, in broken condition and uh, then basically took it apart and put it back together using modern parts. However, he has used as many of the original buttons and dials as possible and the original build uh, took out the uh, beautiful tiny little cathode ray screen, which in my notes here, by the way, I've put, uh, uh, he put a 3.2 inch TFT display in place of the incredibly cute CRT screen. I want, I want one so much. Oh God, I want one. <laughs> I, I think I really want one. The cathode ray screens, yeah, they're so lovely. But he uh, replaced the little cathode ray screen with an almost perfectly fitting TFT display and used a Teensy 4 to power everything else. So there's an FM receiver uh, module in there, uh, a DAC for uh, outputting the audio as courtesy of the Teensy Audio Shield that they create, uh, and a cheap audio amp and a Bluetooth module in there as well. I think he also replaced the speaker. He wanted to use the original speaker, but uh, the quality on it had just degraded too much over time. So he put um, a similarly sized speaker in. 
Now, everything I'm talking about here is documented far better by Tom himself in the Blue Sky thread. I just want to sort of go through this uh, to give you the kind of history behind it, because that was the original 2022 build. He uh, added functionality uh, for an FM receiver with some beautiful uh, bit crushing in there to make it sound uh, as old as it looks, um, and a few other things as well. However, um, he abandoned the project as it never quite worked the way that he wanted it to until now. So the new version both upgrades and extends the project. Um, there's a new IPS display in place of the old TFT display, which obviously looks a lot nicer. And by the way, just throughout this entire project, if you look at the videos on Blue Sky, um, massive props for the GUI. It's just beautiful. It's an alien themed uh, GUI. If you, if you know what I mean, you know, um, the corporation logo and boot up and everything like that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a really beautiful uh, visualization of everything that's going on. Um, and he also reordered the PC PCB inside it, uh, the solder board inside uh, uses now silicon jumper wires. And I don't know if I've actually talked about this on the show at any point, but if you haven't got any silicon jumper wires, do yourself a favor, order yourself a packet of silicon jumper wires. They are so much nicer. They don't melt when you go near them with a the soldering iron. They're great. Do yourself a favor and get some. There was also a complete audio rebuild. So whereas the old one used a Teensy to uh, take all of the inputs from the machine itself, because as I mentioned, he's tried to use as many of the original buttons and dials on the machine as possible to retain its look. So um, all of those were going into the Teensy and everything was happening through it using almost all of its pins. Now he's broken all of this out into separate modules now. So uh, input is taken care of via an Arduino Nano uh, clone, one of the nice old school 80 mega 328P ones, uh, with all of the fun level shifting between 3.3 and five volts that entails. And the TNC is still there, but um, audio is now being taken care of uh, courtesy of an ESP32. That's, uh, that's the Bluetooth sync. So if you want to connect to it as a Bluetooth speaker, the ESP32 is taking care of that. And it's pumping all of the audio through to the TNC using I squared S now. So it's a purely digital system now, um, but it's still in a very much an analog box. And of course, you've still got the FM radio receiver. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is all uh, optionally bit crushed out to give that really uh, genuine, nice sound. Now, the the original build also had a uh, microphone on the board which allowed you to record in and out and that's something that uh, Tom used last time uh, in the older version of it but in the new version there's now a completely secondary use case for it where you can set it to record things and then uh, you can cycle through those recordings and it plays them out again through the same bit reduction so you get that wonderful uh, distant radio sounding stuff someone on a space station uh, giving captains logs lost to the eons of time that you find when your ship docks with them I, immediately went straight into sci-fi. <laughs> So yes, what was an old 1978, an incredible for its time recorder, which is now um, heroically outdated, um, has been given a new lease of life as a, an FM radio and a, a Bluetooth speaker and a way of uh, recording and playing back notes. And um, head to the Blue Sky thread to see all of this in action because Tom has gone through it painstakingly, both the build process and what it can do. One final thing I did want to mention, which is just the absolute cherry on top for me, is that things like Tony boxes that my kids have and um, Amiibos, which I'm not that familiar with, but I'm aware of very similar thing, Nintendo figures with NFC tags in the bottom of them. These are things that allow you to put them on top of a box and it will read an NFC tag and then play an associated bit of audio. Um, he's put this in to the Jackal now, but you can put anything that has an NFC tag in it onto the thing and it will read that NFC tag. And then the next thing you can do is give it some custom audio to play back in that uh, position. So he's, he's essentially in incorporated the concept of a Tony box into the Jackal, uh, just one of many, many features that he's added to this beautiful old piece of hardware. Yeah, I, I don't think I could love this project anymore. Tom, if you do ever randomly stumble across this, uh, fantastic job on this, it is really wonderful. You have absolutely inspired me to get back into uh, trolling eBay for old radio listings and seeing what uh, old DDR radios I can find in Berlin to, uh, to give a similar treatment to. That has been our show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, the cricket is still here. Um, I hope that the background sounds aren't putting you off too much. I am really enjoying the challenge of putting this show out in a variety of beautiful locations, but I do understand if you're used to listening to this with a high quality audio gear with my usual studio mic with its very low noise floor, this must come as a bit of a shock. Um, although hopefully the content is still interesting enough for you to want to stick around. And um, I will be continuing to do this for the next few weeks on the road before I get back to the attic of dreams. Um, I'm always happy to hear your suggestions 
questions about the show, anything you would like to hear more of, anything you would like to hear less of. And yes, you can say the wind if you wish. Um, but uh, thank you all so much for your continued support, especially those of you who chose to choose to go to the Electromaker store in order to buy your next things for your next projects, because that directly funds me being able to do this and share my enthusiasm with you every week. I'll be back with you next time from, uh, I'll be back with you next time from another location. I'm not sure where that will be at this point. That's part of the beauty of what we're trying out here. Uh, but until then, I hope you have a safe, fun and creative week and I'll chat to you then.